Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I want to begin with a dangerous topic this morning. We're going to talk about marriages. Today we're going to talk about relationships of all kinds, <laughs> including marriages. So I want to start with a marriage story, give you guys like kind of a window in, right? So my wife and I, we've been married for a long time. We've been together for over 20 years. I guess that's not a long time to some of you here, but that's another thing. But to me, long time. Goes fast. So <laughs> no extra jokes. So here's the thing. We help one another with certain things. There's certain things that we're good at, and I just kind of like resign myself. To, you, that's it. I won't do it. You do that, right? So for me, it's grocery shopping. Like, I'm very bad at that, apparently. I'm not very good at groceries. I spend way too much money, and it's like you'll come back with, like, a whole cart of breakfast cereal, right? There's just no real food according to my wife. So she does all my meals. She does all my meals, except for lunch on the weekends. That is where I have my cheat meals, right? I make it for myself, and I go nuts, right? So it's hot dogs and pizza and all kinds of stuff like that, right? So... My wife, being very observant, notices that after said cheat meals, I usually have stomach problems. And I'm like, yeah, because you're only supposed to eat like that if you're a 15-year-old boy, right? So that's, that's it. And if you're 15 years old, like, hey, I'm not a boy. Yes, you are, right? So, <laughs> so anyway, you know, th that's it. It's the only time anybody's supposed to eat like that. So I'm like, whatever. So she says, look, we got to do a sensitivity check. I'm like, why? Like, again, I told you, I know I'm not. It's a cheat meal. The operative word is the first word. Cheating's never good, right? I get it, right? So sensitivity check, all this stuff going on and on. And so finally, I'm like, okay, what do we got to do? She goes, I'm going to need seven hairs. <laughs> now, let me just translate. Like, if you're 15 years old, you don't understand what was just said, right? So what was just suggested is that we remove seven very valuable members from your rapidly shrinking team. I'm like, no, no, you cannot have them, right? So some time goes by. You might say, oh, you don't look like I have a problem. Yeah, 30 years ago, this was a thick, beautiful mane of rock and roll hair, right? So it's not the same. So anyway, we did that for another time. And I'm not embarrassed of the pictures. It was awesome back then. We rocked. All right, so before I get off on a tangent, what happens is she comes up to me and she's like, did the test results come in? Like, this is several days later, and I'm like, like I'm, I forget, I forget a lot of stuff lately, but the first thing I think is, did she really steal my team members in my sleep? Like, I can't trust this woman anymore. Like, did that happen? And so because, like, it's like Jesus, she reads my mind, or Jedi mind trick, or because we've been married for a long time, and she knows what I'm thinking. And so she says, no. She answers me, right? Like, it's like a Jesus moment. She answers me, my question, and she says, no, I got them from around your sink. And, yeah, and the first thing, I think I'm much cleaner than that. How did she do this? But then the pastor in me is like, well played. Like she worked this whole scenario pretty well, right? She got what she needed for my health, all this stuff without, you know, damn, they, they already quit the team, so it's okay. You know what I mean? Like, it's all good, right? So I was like, well done. But then a part of me felt like, why do I feel like I'm under investigation for something? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's kind of weird. All right. Oh, and yes, the sensitivity, cheese. I can't have any cheese. Now, is that going to stop me from putting cheese on my pizza? Absolutely not. No. So whatever. There we go. We help, right? So we help one another, but sometimes it doesn't work out. So we're going to talk about unity in relationships and your part in it, right? So you, Nitty. So we're following Paul. I thought that was such a clever title, but, you know, <laughs> you know, we're following uh, Paul through uh, the book of Acts. So we arrive at Ephesus. And so we saw the riot in Ephesus. The big thing there between Acts 19 and 20 was like the commercialism of religion, right? So you have them selling the trinkets, right, at the temple, and they're making money. Paul disrupts that, so they want to kill Paul. They have the riot there, right? So he leaves, comes back, gives a speech in Miletus to the Ephesian elders, Ephesus, right? And he warns them about this stuff. They're going to be false teachers. They're looking to build a following, aka, you know, get money, right? So more commercialization. So we looked at what a biblical church should look like, a.k.a. C3 Church in Naples, right? Like, so why we're trying to do what we're trying to do. Today, we're going to look at your part in that a little bit more. That's really what Ephesians talks about. Now, 
Ephesians is a really interesting letter. A lot of like big high theology in Ephesians, really beautiful, but it has a simple reason for writing. Think Romans, same thing. Like everyone's like, oh, Romans, theological work. Yes, but the reason for writing is unity and disunity. So the Jews and the Gentiles, you can go back and watch that. I won't give the whole story again. They're all Christians, but they're Jewish. So think like these ethnic breakdowns, right? Ethno-religious breakdowns. Uh, and they're fighting over it, the Gentiles and the Jews. So that's the reason. Unity. Now, uh, Ephesians, if I visualize it, I kind of visualize it like these concentric circles. Like uh, take a, a pebble or a rock and throw it in the water and, whoop, 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 and it kind of radiates just like that. It makes that sound out. <laughs> but except it goes inward until so it focuses on you. So big, big theology, right? No Jews or Gentiles. Christ, the body of the, you know, the, the, the body of Christ is the church. Then it focuses a little bit more on you and your personal relationships until it gets right down to it like that. All right, so that's kind of how it works. We want to keep in mind as we read this, uh, I'm going to encourage you to read it on your own. I'm going to do key parts of Ephesians, um, but read it on your own, right? So I tell you all the time, don't believe anything any man says, like this, you believe that, all right? Uh, there's going to be interwoven prayers. Keep in mind, Paul is in prison, or at least he has been detained. We'll see that as we move through Acts. So he's a prisoner. Some say Rome, but he might just be detained. So anyway, he's in prison. Think of it that way. Let's hop right in. Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus, who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So common opening for Paul. You see that grace and peace. This should be setting the tone for you. Grace and peace, right? So this is how it goes. Why the blank? This is really interesting. Nerd, I'm going to get like nerd glasses with tape on them when I do this. Nerd glasses on. So if you want to nerd out with me for a minute, this is really interesting. In the original, or I shouldn't say original, but some of the early manuscripts, it's blank. It doesn't say Ephesus there at all, but it does in some other ones. And you're like, why, pray tell, might that be? Well, uh, we'll see Tychicus delivers the letter. So Paul, prisoner, he's not going to deliver the letter. He's always sending people with these letters. Guy delivers it, but it's what I like to call a regional letter. So it's a letter that goes out to this region. We're going to get to Colossians, and we're going to see that it's like half of it is like the same, the same exact verses. Right? So that is also to that region. So that's what we're going to do. This Ephesian, this Asia Minor, this, this, this area... We're going to now do a whole bunch of those letters to that area. First and Second Timothy, Colossians, and Philemon. Talks about the same people in the same general space. So what Paul would be able to do then is say, hey, you know, when you give it the letter to this place close by or this place, fill in the city name. I'm going to say the same thing, just like he does in Colossians. The Colossians. He says basically the same thing. It's just a little bit shorter. All right, so what's really interesting, if you read your Bible a lot, do you notice at the end of Colossians, it says, and read the letter to Laodicea. And then you, you know, and count on you for that. You notice that, right? <clears throat> and you're like, wait a minute. There's no Laodiceans in my Bible, except I know Revelation. But that's not what we're talking about. From Paul, the letter I wrote to. So a lot of people think Ephesians is also that missing letter to the Laodiceans. Okay, I'm done. All right, so Paul talks about spiritual blessings and God's mysterious plan, right? And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Big, right? So that's what. Then he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that the Jews, who were first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. Unity, right? So unity. You're going to hear this word a lot. Paul's interwoven prayers, if I didn't mention that. A lot of prayers just interwoven through Ephesians. Constantly praying through the whole thing. Uh, first one we get, I pray for you constantly. He prays for spiritual wisdom. And he continues, Ephesians 1.18. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. Literally, the eyes of your hearts having been enlightened. So that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. This holy people, or saints, same word. Who are rich and glorious, his rich and glorious inheritance. Again, he prays. I also pray that you understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those who believe him. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So we talked about the body of Christ. And this is going to talk a lot about the body of Christ, right? So we, the church. Ephesians 2, 1, turn the page. 
Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all his, he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Okay. So, stop. Important theology. I talk about this all the time, right? Grace. We are saved by grace, right? Through our faith in Jesus. That's it, right? But keep reading so that we can do good works. Like, that's very important. Those are the evidence of our salvation, right? Judge a tree by its fruit. Those are the works. So, we've talked about that a lot. That's all I'm going to say about that right there. Good theology there. Uh, again, remember that in 2 Corinthians 4, we talked about Satan being the god of this world. Very interesting. So here it says that, right? And those who obey him, what? They have this, like, the spirit of the devil in their hearts, right? So they don't have the Holy Spirit. They have the spirit of the devil. We saw 2 Corinthians 6. Those two cannot have fellowship together. That's it. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are not filled with Satan, period. You are not filled with demons or anything like that, right? So that whole deliverance ministry we talked about, is for people who are not Christians. Right? So just remember that when you hear about things, the spirit of the devil. If the spirit of the devil is in you. You do not have the Holy Spirit in you. You are not saved. That's scary, right? So no, if you are saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So Paul continues. He talks about oneness and peace in Christ. Like So before you were living apart from him, but now you have been, and he says it again, united in Christ Jesus. So United, united. Key here, Ephesians 2.14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. This word occurs a lot. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Right? So one people. We are one body now. So it's this breakdown. We've talked about it before of all these ethnic divisions. There's no like races. Our identity is not in anything but Jesus and that's what unites us all. When our identity is 100% in Christ, that's it, right? That's what we need. So notes on the law. Um, so did you notice that this is really not what Ephesians is all about? More like Galatians, right? So we are not under the law. It's another false teaching that some people give that somehow we could even still do that. No, ended the law. That's it, right? So now we have Christ. A temple for the Lord comes up as a theme. We've talked about that also. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house. And also what? To extend into, you know, like let's say 1 Corinthians 12. Like we are temples of the Holy Spirit as individuals. Continued theme comes up, the mysterious plan. We'll talk about it as we go into chapter 3. Uh, more prayer. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. So more prayers. And then we enter chapter 4, Ephesians 4.1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So these things come up again and again. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to, one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. One, one, one. Unity, peace, right? So are we seeing it? Now, it's interesting. However, 
<laughs> he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Let's give a hedge a little bit. Ephesians 4.11. What are they? Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Keep reading. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. All right, so we have all these special gifts, but they are for what purpose? Us. <laughs> Bragging, right? No, they are for unity. They're for togetherness, for the building up of the church, right? One one. We've got to keep reading that, right? Because people will run with this. If you've been in church for a long time, you might have uh, heard about the five-fold ministry. And this is where it comes from. But to me, that is selling God short. It's putting God in a box. Why? Because if you look at the full counsel of God's word, you see that Romans 12 talks about way more gifts, right? And it's a more definitive list, actually. It's like first, apostles, second. So, uh, that might be a better list, but I still wouldn't use that. I'd go to Romans 12 as well. Lots of different gifts there too, right? So this is really like a churchianity, you know, make a program type of thing so we can sell you books. Like that's what the fivefold ministry is. It, it just when we it just falls short of the full counsel of God's word, to say nothing else. Um, when we divide and become prideful of our ministries, we miss the whole point. We have to read that next verse, right? What's the purpose of what I do right now? It's to bring, it's to build up the church, bring you all together into unity until we reach maturity where we don't even care about these things anymore. Right? That should be the attitude everybody has from, you know, the rock star worship leaders to the rock star pastors. Like, we're just trying to get you guys to move forward and stop looking at me so much and stop focusing on Jesus, right? So that's the point. So let's not do the, you know, these are the ministries, and then what do they do? The people jump into the roles, and I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle, I'm a this, and it's like, and you miss the whole point, right? So just trash that. Uh, Ephesians 4.13, this will continue. Again, I'm just picking up off that last line. Until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature, like immature children, or immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies that sound so clever they sound like the truth. Talked about that last week. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes us whole, the whole body fits together perfectly. Sorry, my tablet just decided to do something really crazy. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing full of love. No, I do not want that right now, Mr. Tablet. I want the scriptures. The tablet's trying to sell me something. I forgot to take it off of Wi-Fi. So anyway, <laughs> technology. God love it. All right. So let's not get sidetracked by me. Unity. <laughs> Again, unity, right? Each part comes together in unity, right? For what? Church health, for a healthy body of Christ, right? So we're all different parts. Note on the false teachers, Right? Lies. They're so clever. They sound like the truth. So we talked about that last week. We're not to be immature children, as he continues, but to be like children of the light. And so there's light versus darkness thing. Throw off your old sinful nature, and instead, let the Holy Spirit, right, renew your thoughts and attitudes. That's the idea here. Put on your new nature, created to be like God. He talks about, stop telling lies. <laughs> let us tell the neighbors the truth for all parts of the same body. Again, so it all comes back to that unity, unity, unity. So remember the anger we talked about. Ephesians 4.26 and don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger or while you're angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Not good, right? So he continues, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for hard work. Uh, then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Jump, Ephesians 4, 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Stop and look at that. All right, we should all look at that. Rage, harsh words, slander, and anger are all evil behavior. Right? A lot of Christians out there, you need to see that, right? Maybe just put that on your monitor of your computer before you go on the Facebook, right? So watch it. Watch it. And that goes for everybody, all ages. <laughs> all right. 
Ephesians 5, 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, even on the line. <laughs> you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, followed by the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. We talked about those sacrifices. That's what it says like in the Old Testament. So he's bringing it in there. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. I've seen stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Sorry to let you hear that, right? You're disappointed. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. So we are to be like that pleasing aroma. Romans 12, we are to be a living sacrifice. That's our true worship. Singing, just an extension. It's living as a sacrifice, being like Jesus. Philippians 2, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who died for you. He's the ultimate sacrifice. We're not called to like walk away from that. We're called to be sacrificial like him. That's the point. All right, so again, this is like Galatians 5, the sin list here, and you won't enter the kingdom of God. It's like, if this is not scary, you don't have a mirror. All right, so this should be scary. This should be like, what? And so the... Greedy people is right up there with sexual sin. There's no delineation here. And then he doubles down on the greed, right? For a greedy person, it's an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Uh-oh. So we really need to do this as a Christian community. I'm not talking mostly you guys here. You're cool. But right? What did 1 Corinthians 5 say? You do not judge others outside the church. You judge those inside the church, outside the church. They don't know. God will deal with them. Well, how are we supposed to win them over? peacefully, gently, lovingly, right? Like we're all perfect? No. So we got to be very careful before we cherry pick our favorite sin to pick on and then pick at it, right? No. The greedy person, let's work on that. Mirror. Ephesians 5, 6. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. Ever hear that? For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, there's that theme, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for the light, and for this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Again, children of light. We talked about how to expose them this week. Who should be exposing them, right? Like leaders, teachers, right? People like that expose the bad teachers. That's important. And people will excuse these sins. You ever hear that in church? Oh, that's not a big deal. Well, that's not what I see here. I see it as a very big deal. All even playing field. Right? So Ephesians 5.15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most out of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine. Because that will ruin your life. <laughs> so instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So opportunities, right? And we see that all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Bible. We're supposed to use, like, these people who are struggling in the outside world as opportunities. And also, what? Among one another in the body opportunities, right? So when we have the opportunity to help one another, what did it say in Galatians? Therefore, as we have the opportunity, right? You got to do good to those, especially in the household of Christ. Opportunities. So now this next section, this is where these circles get smaller, right? So it's like in verse. It starts to get smaller here. So now, right, all this big stuff, right? Jesus, the church, God the Father, Jews and Gentiles, these ethnic, ethnic groups. Now it's going to be you, right? So it's going to come right down. Spirit-guided relationships, it says, and further, and you've got to pay attention, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Amen. We're done for today. That's it. I'm going <laughs> to get in a lot of trouble. But that's what a lot of people do, right? Have you heard that? That's what a lot of people do. But, but, okay. For a husband is the head of the wife just as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church, as the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. And keep reading. Yeah, that's dangerous territory. The word of God tells us what that looks and sounds like. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. 
He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. I like that. We're washed by God's word. So it continues a little bit on that. And in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. So then there's a one flesh teaching and all that. So both. You can't be united, right, if one side's doing all the doing and the other side's doing all the pulling or the, being the aggressor. You can only be united if you're both doing the same thing, like loving one another. So it continues. There's no chapter breaks in the original. Uh, relationships and families, children and parents, right? Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. I can't see that far, but anyway, she's around here somewhere. But, <laughs> and... Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Both. Right? Uh, slaves and masters. I I've told you this before, that when we see the word slave in the Bible, it's not racism. It's commerce back in that day. Right? So you could be the same race and have a slave. So don't think of it like that. Think of it like employers and employees. Right? So Employees, work with enthusiasm, which says slaves literally, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. That's how you should work. Really like First Peter. This is a lot like First Peter as we go into 2, then 3. A lot like it. Uh, I like First Peter. It expands, I think, on it uh, quite a bit. But, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Peter actually says, like, slaves, if you're mistreated, whatever. You know, so was Christ. Right? Don't repay insult for insult. So goes a little farther. But anyway, we see balance when we look to the full counsel of God's word. Remember, the theme is what? Unity, right? So Paul wouldn't be saying, wives, you just obey your husbands, and husbands, do whatever you want, right? No, the theme is unity. You both, Jews and Gentiles, right? Now wives and husbands, slaves and masters, you know, parents and children, same thing, over and over and over again, peace. Ephesians 6.10, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground. Putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. You are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Couple that with the anger. You're not supposed to be around, right? No. What is the context? Unity, not disunity, not fighting. The armor is for defense. What are you standing your ground in? Cole Haan shoes. She got them on sale. Awesome. No, shoes of peace, right? <laughs> right? Shoes of peace. I'm trying to wake you guys up. All right? Peace. You're wearing the shoes of peace when you stand your ground. All right? So the weapon here. All right, so the Bible, right, could be Jesus, the sword, judgment sword that comes from his mouth. He's going to come back and do the judging. We don't do that, all right? So, or the Bible, the word of God, which tells us what? To be peacemakers, that's what it tells us, right? Not physical weapons. So when we were in 2 Corinthians, you get that from 2 Corinthians 10. We don't fight with weapons like man-made weapons of the world. But instead, he says, pray in the Spirit at all times, on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. How did they break Peter out of jail in Acts? They prayed him out, right? They didn't go with like swords and clubs and things like that. No, they prayed him out. Tychicus will give you a good report or a full report on how I'm doing, what I'm doing, when I'm getting along. So it talks about the guy who delivers the letter. And this is how it ends. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, full circle. So, last week, we talked about things that divide the church, right? things that cause disunity. We got to denominations. A lot of people don't realize that, that that is like one of Paul's worst nightmares. Right? Unity that the church would ever divide over what fancy terms is called secondary doctrine. For example, 
right? Romans 14. One of the issues, meat sacrifice style is too complicated if you don't know, but you can talk about it at a Bible study if you haven't heard it, bless you. Uh, the other one is the Sabbath, right? So some people were saying you need to keep a Sabbath. You need to do that. Paul's like, whatever. One person thinks that day's holy. The other person thinks, don't divide over it. But yet, what do we have today? People who say, there are churches who say, if you don't worship the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week like we do, you can't come here and be in peace with us. Disunity. We're going to start our own church over that. And it continues. And it continues. Any denomination, they'll take that secondary doctrine that's not primary, that's not the gospel, and say, you know what? We can't be brother and sister in Christ because of that. What? It's not a sin. You know, talking about sinful things, we just see this a little differently. Now, the gospel who Jesus is, what he did for us, that's a hell I'm going to die on, right? Like, but even in that case, I know of some unbelievers that come to our church and their faith is lacking, they don't really believe. You are welcome here. Let me see, you can't eat with us? What, am I a Pharisee? Yes, that's what these people are. So denominational people are a bunch of Pharisees, right? If you don't believe things exactly the way I've got it, that's it. You know, you're not righteous, you're not holy, you're not redeemed. You're like, Okay, and you have churches today in Naples across the street from one another saying, they're not saved, right? They're not saved. What do you think Paul, do you believe the gospel? Yes. What do you think Paul would say about that? A rebuke, a rebuke. So <clears throat> our part in the disunity, so let's start thinking about that. Like maybe it's not the denominational stuff. <laughs> so it's really funny. Like a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, there are those in the church who are very self-reflective. You know, but even those people at times when I say things about certain sins, like somebody else will come to mind. Then there are those that are sitting there like maybe like ribbing their spouse, you know, like the whole time, right? It's you. He's talking about you. He's like, so a, a preaching trick, right? Because people are like, wow, you go hard on everything. It's like, I know because a lot of people are thinking about someone else. You can, right? So today, if that's you, if you have a tendency to do that, I want you just to think about Yes, now I'm talking about you, right? So think, so especially you. So I want you to think about your part in this, in all these situations, right? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing, self-reflecting, right? So we are the body of Christ. We want to look at our parts in the unity. We all have special roles, right? But they all come together in unity. Now, on that, <clears throat> there's one step we have to take, right? <laughs> So have you ever noticed something? It seems like, seems like, this could be me, but it seems like, and it's not just this church, just everywhere, it seems like the people that are doing all the criticizing are the ones who don't have their stuff together. Have you ever noticed that? Like, it's like projection. You know, the, there's always something, like, glaringly wrong. You know what I mean? Like Jesus says, you know, like, take the log out of your eye. It's supposed to be hyperbole, right, to get the guy to see. Like, you have this log on your face, and you're talking about this other guy's you know, splinter. You know what I mean? So it, it's just so true, and especially true in a lot of churches, you know, where people are, like, minding everybody else's ministry but their own, or most of the time not doing anything. <laughs> like not participating, right? But they got a problem with everything. The message, the pastor's message, the music, the blah, blah, blah. it's like the coffee, this, and there's not enough food. I'm like, dude, you don't do anything, right? So that's usually the case. And then the people who like have their stuff together, they usually don't, right? They're too busy, right? <laughs> They're busy doing stuff, like taking care of their own stuff, right? So yeah, we're saved by grace. Why? So that no one can boast. Why? Because we will. Like that's why. <laughs> Now, here's a really funny thing, and I'm going to, I'll control myself. I will, Holy Spirit, self-control, right? Have you ever had someone tell you, think about your job now, how to do your job? <laughs> Who doesn't know how to do it, right? So for me, right, like, like this is like, and you guys are awesome, so I'm not saying this about anyone here but you. Um, so, <laughs> so we're friends. So, so, you know, like, but a lot of people, they think, oh, a pastor just works one hour on Sunday, right? And that's it, you know. Uh, or there's like a bunch of people like uh, telling me everything they know about a book that they haven't finished yet, right? So <laughs> it makes no sense, right? But, you know, maybe in your profession this happens. I think about phony professions. We talked about the doctor and like how we all lie to the doctor. And like imagine there being like an honest doctor or a dishonest doctor and like you were actually honest. So, <laughs> so like, you know, that must be a really annoying job. Because like can you imagine going, I mean, if you're a doctor, you can. I'm preaching to the choir. But like... 
like eight years, I don't know how many millions of dollars you have to spend on college and all this other stuff, right? To get all this stuff down. Then you have like the patient because why? The internet and now they know everything, right? So like they come in and they just like, they self, I think it's this pretty much. I'm coming here just to get the script, like, you know, just to check the box. You can't possibly know what you're talking about. You know, I like, I think that has to be a really annoying job. Lawyer, lawyer has to be a really, really annoying job, right? Because the internet, right? So like, this is what I think we should do. This is our legal strategy. They're kitchen table lawyers, right? Everybody's a lawyer, right? Whenever anything happens to you, right? Everyone comes around you with legal advice. Isn't that funny? Like anything, well, this is really what you should do. You know, you need to immediately make sure that this paperwork and you got this, and I'm like, like you, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like get a lawyer. Like it's kind of what they're trained to have to pass the bar. Like it's kind of difficult, I heard. So like, like, oh my gosh. And the worst one has to be cops. Right? Cops, right? So you have this attitude. So, like, they don't know why they pulled you over. And, so that's the first, and they make a mistake, I think. You know, do you know why I pulled you over? Don't ask that question, right? Like, <laughs> because, you see, already they're like, oh, I can answer that question. No, I don't. You know, like, there's really no reason for you to pull me over. You know, not the stop sign I blew through. Because the other guy, even look at the guy behind me. Do your job. The guy behind me also blew through the red light, right? It turned, and then he was last. Why didn't you get him? You do your job, right? Don't I pay you? So it's got to be really annoying. But if this is you and your job, did you like it? What did you think of the... Did it make you feel good? No. The answer is no. So then don't do it. There's your business, and then there's none of your business. That's it. Right? So staying in your own lane, that's what I kind of call it, like staying in your own lane. This is critical to building up the church. It is critical to ministry. And when you question people, just as a side thing, you know what you're saying to them? You don't know what you're doing. There's no intentionality to your, your plan at all. Really. You know? And if you've been here for a while, there's plenty of intentionality. And just because I'm not doing anything about it doesn't mean anything. Maybe I know more about that person's situation than you do. Oh, imagine that. There's a plan. But it says, like, you're kind of stupid. You didn't see that. You're not. But that's how it makes us feel, correct? So be very careful. And, and again, this church is really healthy compared to a lot of churches I've worked in, the church we used to be especially. Very healthy. It's not necessarily you, but it's a good reminder, right? So nobody, they're like, what did I do? You didn't do anything, right? But we just don't need those armchair quarterbacks, especially in church. Right? Really annoying. But here's the thing. Well, side note. And I'm going to tick off everybody who loves sports, which is like everybody but me. So, <laughs> so this is the one place, right, when we get it right, we can say, we won. Because when you guys do it in front of the television and you never played the game and you can't play the game, it looks ridiculous to me when you say, we won. I'm like, you have like ice cream, popcorn, soda, and you can't run like 10 feet to the fridge. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I'm done with that rant too. All right, so <laughs> cleaning up your, so I'm so glad you guys laughed, you like sports. So anyway, cleaning up your side of the street, right? Just worry about your side of the street. There's probably a mess there, you know, you need to clean up. Unless you are asked, right? Unless you're invited or asked, mind your own ministry. So make sure you're doing your job right. All right, so each one of us has been given a special gift, that's it. And they're all the same. 1 Corinthians 12, right? We don't have all the gifts. Some have this, some have that. And remember the prosopopec with the hand talking, right? So the foot talking and the eye and the ear talking. So, all right, so he made that example to let us know. Some people are ears, some people are mouths, some people are hands, some people are feet, right? They're all critically important to what we do here. So we want to build each other up and accomplish God's work in unity in this way. And so this isn't like I'm just topical here. So it's not necessarily that we have a problem. Now, that's the church. And, th and so there's outside the church, and that's where you might have a problem. So let's talk about <laughs> Ephesians takes us into our personal lives, right? So the Bible talks a lot about servant relationships, right? So Jesus, right? So you think about what he's saying, right? Mark 10, Matthew 20, right? The Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, Right? And if we keep reading the Bible, you need to be like Jesus. It tells us over and over and over again. What did Jesus do? Wash feet. And what does he tell him? Right? You're not greater than the master. So what should you do for each other? Like get to the foot washing, right? So we need to be like Jesus and serve. And so here's the thing. Servant relationships sound really difficult because our world, our culture, we talked about this, uh, teaches transactionally. Like, everything's transaction in our culture, not relationally, right? So what do I get? 
What do I get back? What happens if I serve that person? And so this is the way we're raised. This is the way we think. This is the way the world, which is evil, trains us to think. So we got to flip it if we want to be Christians, if that's what we're calling ourselves, being like Christ. Now, I will say something. Just to kind of get a head start, like if you what, if you're not serving a lot, you're not living a servant type of life. Um, nobody's Jesus, but you know we're working on it all at different levels. I will say something: that serving others is very therapeutic. It's very therapeutic, and so what I saw as a pastor over the last couple of years was uh, people isolating, isolating. And what happens when people isolate is it's like you know, called getting in your own head. That's what happens. Like, so if you spend too much time alone, this is what's going to happen. You start just thinking. You start awfulizing. You start just thinking about your own problems. And then you start like, letting it grow into problems that don't even exist. They're not now problems. They're like future problems that may not ever happen. Right? But you're worried about them and you start freaking out about it. And then you freak out about this. You've got like 10 million things that you're freaking out because you're stuck in your own head. Right? And then a lot of people get put on a pity pot and they never get off of it, right? So it's like, oh, whoa, it's me. You know, and they don't think about anybody else, but this is what happens when we don't do life with other people, when we are detached from the body of Christ. Of course it's no good. When you detach yourself from the body of Christ, well, you're not a part of it. You know, and you're going to start becoming what? Selfish. But what does Jesus say? First requirement to being a Christian, deny yourself. Pick up your cross. You could die then you can follow me. Read your Bible. He's pretty repetitive about these, right? Deny yourself. But what are you doing? You're in your own head, worried about your own stuff. You're in your head, worried about... That's what it does. That's what isolation does to you. So it's so important. We get out of that isolation. So when you start serving others, you're not always thinking about yourself. You realize that, oh my gosh, other people have problems too. It's amazing. And then you're going to find out that other people may have bigger problems than you. And then you start becoming more empathetic, right? And in the beginning, you know, you may transference, you may think about you again, you just got to train yourself out of that habit. But think about them. It's very therapeutic, getting out of your own head and into someone else's. And this is a key to relationships. This is a key to serving, getting into right, your spouse's head, understanding the way they think, right? Or your children or children, your parents, like why are they doing what they're doing? And then being empathetic, not critical about it, right? Have I done that? Have I done worse? Like, all right, let's start thinking about that person and serving them. So in marriage, it goes both ways, right? So I will say this with a disclaimer. I'm not talking about abusive relationships. I'm talking about fairly normative relationships, if there is such a thing. But <laughs> a spouse's treatment of you is often, not in an abusive relationship, is often a reflection of how you're treating them, right? So in a fairly healthy relationship, as things start going bad, you need to put the mirror up and go, wait a minute. You know, same thing with parents and children. So that's a really annoying thing if you have kids, right? You see you and the kid and you're like, oh, I do that or I say that, right? So we want to find ways to get in their head and understand them. Now, I don't espouse a lot of programs. I don't, you know, if you couldn't tell already, like this is the program guide and I don't like these catchy things and people trying to sell me stuff. But there is one that I kind of like, especially for couples counseling, but it goes for relationships with friends, uh, parents and children, five love languages. If you have done it, go revisit it. It's really good. You can do it online for free. You don't have to spend any money at all. So I met the author. A nice guy, gave a great speech. I didn't feel from him like he was trying to get rich off of it. Uh, but basically the idea is that you are giving love to your spouse, your friend, whatever it is, your employer, employee, in a way in which they want to receive it or they can receive it. Right, so your love language, a typical example, right, for guys, <laughs> you know, so there's like a physical touch, words of affirmation, right, so the other thing, then there's gifts, acts of service, right, so things like that. So guys, like, wait, they want what? Physical touch, right? So that's what guys want, but a lot of women don't always want that, right? So if you go up to your wife, I almost said woman, which is funny, but if you go up to your wife and you're like, physical touch, physical touch, physical touch, you know, and then she doesn't receive love like that, doesn't want to do that right now, she's like get away from me. And you're like, what? You don't want me? Uh, and then it's this terrible thing, right? And she's like, no, I'm just not now. You know, but you were supposed to buy me a gift. So here's the thing. If you know that her love language is gifts, right? Ah, right? It's not physical touch. It's not her thing. 
buy the gift, and then get your physical touch, right? So there you go. I just solved a big problem for a lot of people. So, <laughs> but does it make sense, right? A funny example makes sense, right? So all the wives are going to get all these gifts. They're like, thanks, Pastor Gene. Right? So anyway, uh, but it goes both ways, right? So you're trying to serve your spouse. You're trying to not think about your head, what you like, all you, 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 you. You're trying to get out of your own head and understand what the person likes. So take the quiz, like, if you don't know your spouse yet. <laughs> and then it'll kind of, you know, understand. Like, she wants the gifts. She wants the house to be clean. Like, whatever it is, right? So that's the key here is understanding the person you're trying to love and what they like. Same thing with parents and kids, as I said. Now, especially if we have unbelievers in the family, 1 Peter, again, that's where it goes into this a little bit, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, right? So if there's unbelievers in the family, this is how you do it. This is how you do it, and the Bible tells us this, right? So on wives in 1 Peter 3, right? So you serve your husbands, and then maybe the unbelieving spouse will be won over by your good deeds, by your good behavior, right? And 1 Peter 7 is, it, uh, I'm sorry, so sorry, there's no 7 there. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7 um, <clears throat> talks about, uh, you, you, your spouse may be saved through you. Like, how's that possible? Only Jesus saved. No, no, no. Meaning, put it together with 1 Peter 3, that they're going to be won over by your good deeds. And then come to Christ. What? Is this what a Christian is? I want to be one. All right? So, again, parents and children is a big thing. Fathers is a big emphasis there. Right? Don't provoke your children to anger. Right? So, again, we're supposed to be Christ-like to win over our kids if we have kids. All right? So, it's just a fact, right? Children are either a reflection of you or they run from you. That's it, right? There's a reflection of you, or they run from you. The reflection can be good or bad. Pick it. You know, or they're out. And if you know my story, this is not to dishonor my father. I've been very open about it. I was out, right? Because he was just a very churchy type of Christian. He, my whole family was like very involved in church. He was the choir director and the organist and everything, right? But and he would do the churchy thing, but then when he got home, he was a totally different person. That abusive language, that anger, like all that was there. And I was like, what is going on? If that's what it is to be a Christian, I don't want to be one. That's exactly what happened. And so I ran from the faith. <laughs> ran. I was like, Christians, they're hypocrites. Because, well, all that I knew were. Right? The family members, they all would be talking trash about one another. It was like crazy. I was like, this is a lunatic. Aside. Like, I just want to be out of here. It's nuts. Like these, you know, and so I became a hippie and <laughs> peace, man. And so, you know, but I experimented with every other kind of worldview, right? Not all, but a lot. Because what? Bad example. Bad example. If I was like, my dad is just like the nicest guy in the whole world. Like, I, I can't believe it. You know, that's really cool. You know, eventually the door would have been open to come around, right, to him when I needed help. But I didn't. I knew I was just going to get a beating. You know, that, that was it. There was nothing else for me in that relationship. So that's why I ran. In the workplace, you want to win your employer over. And the employees do. You want to treat you. If you have employees, treat them nicely. Show them what it is to be a Christian. But you want to win them over. My goal when I'm working for anyone, my goal is to be, just never be asked like, to do something. Like I got my PD, and that's it. That's all I need. Good. I'm good. Like my goal, you never, because if you ever employed anybody like I have, isn't that annoying? When you constantly have to chase the employees around to do their job, right? That is not a Christian. No. Christian, Christian is a servant. There's someone who's like, I'm going the extra mile. I'm going. And by the way, selfish side of it, that's how you get promoted, right? <laughs> you know, you do like 200% in everything you do. You're just on it. So I hate when I'm, I'm in charge of people having to ask people to do things. Why? Because I have my own job to do, and now I have to monitor you. you know, so nobody likes that. Right? So don't do that. Like, think about your PD and just get it done. With, and the Bible tells us, no complaining. Get another job then. Like, no complaining. Christians don't do that. We're not called to do that. That's what the Bible says. All right? So it can be hard. And so here's the thing. You might have been tempted to ask the wrong question. One that didn't come from Christ. Again, what if they don't reciprocate? What if they don't reciprocate? What, they, what if they're not a mirror? This isn't working. This Christianity isn't working. Ephesians 6, 7. Work with enthusiasm as though you are working for the Lord rather than people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Like, right? So don't miss the context. Everybody is Jesus. The Bible basically teaches that. 
Your enemies are Jesus. Like, when did you see me poor and naked and hungry? That which you did to the least of these, you did it to me. Goats. It's not a good thing. Right? So work as though you're working for the Lord. That is the practical answer in case you're having some spiritual malady this morning. Now, we want to work in the shadow of cross. We want to be mindful of that, what Jesus has done for us, right? Like, how are our lives worse, right? So, and just be mindful of that. But it's got to travel down to the heart. We have to let the Holy Spirit do the work. That's ultimately what we want to do. That's where we want to get. In one of Paul's prayers, he says, He will empower you with inner strength of the Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Then you will understand, right? Then you will be made complete. Then you will be able to love just unconditionally. And with that love, you're going to understand right, that we are not at war with our flesh and blood enemies. We are trying to win them over. It's the ultimate solution to the problem, love. And so we have this spiritual armor for defense. And this is why Paul closes with that. And I hope you can see the context of these verses that are used a lot in church. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth. And that truth is also about yourself. Put on the body armor, right? God's righteousness for shoes. Put on peace. That is what we're wearing when we stand our ground. Hold up the shield of faith. Stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet so you're always mindful of what you're saved by, who you should be like. Grace, you should have that for others as God had that for you. It's undeserved. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, a question every Christian should be asking themselves. Are you equipping yourself with this as the Bible commands you to? Are you in it? Sword of the Spirit. Move forward in your calling in Christ. This morning I want to pray one of the prayers from Ephesians as I close. I pray from God's glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength of the Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. In Jesus' name, amen.